Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So in this class now we will continue with uh, the acquisition parameters that is the different parameters which is required for setting up an NMR experiment. Uh, we saw in the last class a few important ones such as uh, the relaxation delay between the scans, the 90 degree pulse width, locking, shimming, etc. And that is before the pulse is applied. Now what we will see now is what are the parameters to be looked at after the pulse that 1D pulse is applied. So this is uh, shown here. Uh, this is the 90 degree pulse which is shown as a typical pulse program. So, we saw before this what all we have to do up to this point. Now, after the pulse is applied then you have the signal which is called FID. So, this is the induction uh, current uh, EMF which is induced in the coil and that is detected as an FID. So, now if, if you recollect this depends on the T2. If the T2 is short the signal goes down very fast. If the T2 is long the signal will stay longer that means this is oscillation the oscillation depends the how long the oscill oscillation will happen forever, but it is reduced in amplitude because of this T 2 relaxation and the T 2 relaxation reduces the intensity and at some point it goes to 0. So, the acquisition time how long do you record an NMR signal uh, depends on what is this uh, T 2 of the sample. So, in the previous class we saw that we should have a rough idea of the T 1 uh, because we need to set up the relaxation delay. In this particular uh, case we need to know the T2 of the sample. So, we need to know both T1 and T2 of a sample for recording any NMR experiment. Again remember T2 is something which you may know and T1 and T2 will not know exactly for your sample. Uh, it may be a new compound every time you record. So, you should get a rough idea. So, again based on the size of the molecule uh, typically the T2 values can be predicted. So, how long then this should be the time uh, taken? This is typically the time taken about 3 times the T2 because after 3 times the T2 the signal has gone completely to 0. So, this is uh, this can be mathematically shown like this which I will show you which I will derive now here. So, the intensity of this FID is equal to I0 into cosine the frequency that is oscillation in time dependent into e to the power minus t by t2. So, this is the FID, this is the form of the FID, this is what we saw in the last class. Now, if you look at this parameter here, this is causing the decrease in the intensity with respect to time. So, if I take t equal to 1 times t2, then your i is basically i0, let us ignore this term. Uh, say cosine some on um, some frequency that does not depend because that is just an oscillation, but here you see it becomes minus 1 because t is equal to t 2. Now, this is 1 over e. So, 1 over e is 1 over 2.7, so, this is 1 over 2.7 e. So, this is about 30, so it has reduced to about 33 percent. So, you see it was earlier this is if you consider I 0 as 100 percent. Now, I 0 by 2.7 is roughly 33 percent. So, the signal has decayed by 33 percent in 1 times T 2. Now, if I take T equal to 2 times T 2, then it will be here if you look at here it will be I equal to proportional to E raise to minus 2 E square which is now further gone down by square of this. So, which is about 90 percent. So, in about 3 times T 2 the I will be almost uh, equal to 90 uh, only 1 percent or 5 percent. That means, the signal has come down from 100 percent in the when it is here when T is equal to 0 to 5 percent. So, this reduction has happened because of using 3 times T 2. So, by 3 times T 2 the signal has reduced by 95 percent and that is what we uh, we have to keep in mind that when you set up this uh, time delay acquisition time it has to be 3 times T 2 and not more 
if you give more than 3 times T 2, if you look at this here, it will further go down to 1 percent or uh, uh, lesser than that, but then the signal is not present, but the noise will start coming because noise is present always remember. So, noise is which is present coming from the electronics uh, of the system the hardware and that comes uh, it picks up from various sources down this uh, line and all the noises also are accumulated or uh, are collected at in FID. So, FID is a combination of signal and noise. So, if signal is gone to 0, but the noise never goes to 0 it is constantly always present. So, at some point your signal is 0, but the noise is present. So, signal to noise is 0 because signal is 0. So, this is what is the problem that if you record this experiment for too long a time, then you accumulate noise, but there is no signal and the signal to noise goes down. And therefore, this is one of the practical reasons why many times uh, people come up with uh, the argument saying that they are not getting any signal in their sample and the reason being they used a very wrong acquisition time and they would have used probably a 10 times T 2 without realizing because T 2 is something you should have a rough idea and if you wrongly estimate T 2 uh, then you will end up with uh, if you overestimate T 2 you will end up with using a very long time and what happens is the signal has gone to 0 but the noise has accumulated. So, signal to noise goes down if you use a very long acquisition time. So, acquisition time has to be optimized based on uh, the T2 value. Again based on the experience if you look at typically the organic molecules which we study in the laboratory or if you consider biomolecules uh, we let look in this range 100 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. So, in NMR spectroscopy one has to keep in mind this different time values. Uh, this is very important because as we go on it is one should have a feel of what are the different time scales you are using. For example, when we say pulse width you should know that it is in the order of microsecond. If you look at relaxation delay you should know it is in the order of seconds and if you talk about acquisition time one should know that it is an order of 100 milliseconds. So, these are the different time scales uh, and one if one makes a mistake in this time scales uh, remembering then the acquisition and the spectrum becomes pretty uh, comes out bad. Now, the next step is again after you when you are recording the signal there is a hardware component called as a receiver again as the word receiver suggests it is basically receiving the signal. So, if you want to receive the signal you want to receive at the maximum amplitude. So, therefore, you want to increase the intensity the amplitude of the FID uh, it is amplified by then adjusting the gain in the receiver. So, this is what is done this amplification is done so that maximum signal reaches the ADC. What is an ADC? Uh, ADC is called analog to digital conversion converter. So, ADC is what is the next step after we record the X signal we will see that and that signal uh, to maximum signal to reach ADC one has to therefore, increase the receiver gain and receiver gain is simply what is doing is it is simply amplifying it is a scaling up the signal, but remember noise is always there in the signal. So, the noise also gets amplified. So, receiver gain is basically what it is doing it is amplifying signal as well as noise. So, both signal and noise are amplified and then that is fed to the ADC. So, this is where the dynamic range issue comes into picture. What happens is this ADC has a limited capacity to receive signal it cannot arbitrarily receive any large amount of signal that you give. So, let us say you have a solvent signal in your sample and the solvent if as I mentioned in the last uh, class the solvent separation is very important uh, you have a huge uh, signal to noise dynamic range and therefore, if the signal solvent signal exceeds the dynamic exceeds the range of the ADC then we end up with what is called ADC overflow. Uh, you can think of ADC overflow in a similar manner like a, let us say you have a water tank a water tank will some amount of water if you feel more than that it will start overflowing. So, similarly ADC has a limited capacity to hold the signal strength and if you have more signal strength than what it can take it will start overflowing. So, what is overflowing it will simply subtract or it will simply omit the signal ok. So, this is the second uh, important step uh, then what we come to the more important practical point is uh, the scans. So, this is what we also use the word transients in NMR. The number of scans is basically how many times you want to average. So, if you remember uh, in the in one of the classes we mentioned uh, that in 1D NMR 
you record the signal many number of times you do not record it only once you record it many number of times and this many number of times the each time the signal is added and then what you get is a final addition. Of course, the noise also gets added, but remember uh, we said that noise does not increase as much as the signal increases when you add because noise is a random uh, white noise. So, it starts subtracting itself. So, it goes slowly. So, if you do it for a suppose you do a two scans, when you do a two scans the signal will go by twice, but the noise will not go by twice it will go by square root of 2. So, because of that the signal to noise overall increases by square root of the number of scans. So, if you use 16 scans your signal to noise compared to one scan if you use 16 scans then signal to noise will go up by a factor of square root of 16 uh, which is 4. So, depending on the signal to noise one has to basically give a large number of scans. So, again coming to a, from a practical standpoint in organic chemistry and uh, in the standard biomolecular peptides which we use uh, which we record typically about 8 to 16 scans are given, but again remember this is for a 1 millimolar sample a sample concentration where it is around 1 millimolar or more uh, we can record good data with 8 or 16 scans, but if you go to carbon 13 remember carbon 13 we will see uh, uh, later that it is very insensitive compared to hydrogen why because the gyromagnetic ratio is less 4 times and the natural abundance of carbon 13 is also less. So, because of that you need more scans and as written here uh, if you have a good concentration typically let us say you have a 5 millimolar sample or 10 millimolar sample then you need to record uh, uh, with you can record a good data set with at about 256 scans. Okay, so, carbon 13 remember is very less sensitive. So, this is the solvent separation part which we had a brief look at it in the last class uh, we will not go in detail, but I would just like to tell you about what a very most basic type of solvent saturation which is used very routinely that is called as pre saturation. So, pre saturation is shown the picture is shown here. So, this is called a pulse sequence again. So, remember bef before we apply the 90 degree pulse this is the 90 degree pulse we apply what is called as a pre sat this is a nothing but a low power continuous RF radio, radio frequency not a pulse now because pulse means it is in the microsecond, but look at this delay this is about remember this is called relaxation delay and this is of the order of few seconds. So, for the entire relaxation delay period what is done is a weak RF is applied on the solvent at the frequency of the solvent. So, when you apply a weak RF on the solvent frequency what happens is you irradiate the solvent this is called irradiation and you equalize the population you equalize the population of the alpha and beta state of the solvent. So, if you have to re you recollect that we talked about two energy levels in NMR alpha and beta for spin half at, uh, nuclei. So, water for example, has proton and proton has alpha and beta states, but selectively if I apply a continuous RF only on the water protons then the water proton populations between alpha and beta gets equalized after a long time after a certain time and that is called saturation. Uh, we will not be able to go in details of how that particular saturation happens, but the idea is very simple that you take the solvent the signal the chemical shift value of the water protons and you apply at that frequency a weak a weak continuous RF weak means is a really weak signal this is the strength of this signal is typically about 50 to 100 hertz. Uh, remember in NMR when we talk about strength of a radiation irradiation we talk in terms of hertz. So, this is typically kilohertz the uh, the 90 degree pulse width, but this is typically a 100 hertz 50 to 100 hertz. So, at that frequency the 100 hertz is a, the, the range of the amplitude of the, the irradiation, but it is applied on the water resonance or the water proton the solvent proton. So, because of that the solvent proton populations get equalized and remember when the populations are equal the population difference is 0. So, when population difference is 0 no NMR can be done so, that means what this process is doing it is trying to make the solvent signal become 0 by equalizing the population. So, you can it is like a weak irradiation we also use the word saturation and hence the word pre saturation comes pre saturation because is applied before this 90 degree. 
then you apply 90 degree pulse in for a general for all atoms for all nuclei all spins in that molecule. So, what will happen when you record this signal here there will be no contribution to the FID from the solvent because solvent has been already killed or eliminated from the spectrum by irradiating. So, the chemical the oscillations that is the chemical shifts what you see will only come from the sol compound peaks and the solvent peak signals are or oscillation is gone. So, when you do record and you do a Fourier transform and do a finally get a spectrum your spectrum will not contain any solvent peak. So, this is one way to do the solvent separation, but this is a very crude approach uh, a brute force approach we use the word brute force the reason being you are simply doing a uh, just applying a hard uh, radiation or irradiation uh, at a weak radiation at the solvent line. So, this is not really a, the good best solution many times and therefore, pre saturation although is used is the most common approach is not the best approach. The best approach approaches are uh, more advanced called water gate, wet etcetera. Uh, we will see that uh, not now, but in the third or fourth half part of the course where we look at more advanced topics. So, once uh, the data of NMR, NMR data is recorded uh, this next step is to do what is called processing the data. Uh, so, remember the what data comes out in NMR is called FID and FID is basically the raw data which is recorded by physically by a process by a signal by the spectrometer, but that is not what is the spectrum. The spectrum still has to be obtained by massaging uh, thus the raw data and the raw data is massaged uh, by doing many things then it is converted into a spectrum by Fourier transform. This is a mathematical technique which is why the word FTNMR is used, but even after Fourier transform your the, the data is not completely ready to analyze because there are certain things which we have to further operate do on this NMR spectrum and that finally, after all these steps is what you uh, we say that the spectrum is ready for analysis. So, we will see these steps now one by one. So, the first thing is called applying a window function or this is a Greek word apodization. So, what is this thing what do we do in window function is the following that uh, if you remember an S the FID uh, let us go a little further to see this FID and we will come back to the previous slide. So, this is an FID this is this is an FID or oh sorry uh, this side this is an FID. So, you see this is called a raw FID a raw means it is the crude FID which is coming out of the sample and this is what is captured by the uh, this the preamp and then this is stored in the computer in a digital form. This is what is digitized. Now, we have to convert this into a spectrum. So, before doing that we do what is called apodization. Apodization is like multiplying this whole signal with a exponential decay. So, if I multiply this line what you are seeing line here if I multiply with this FID here I will get this is the answer this is the output. So, you see the signal is going down 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 slowly and finally, going to 0. Why this happened? Because this is coming of this exponential decay because of the decay the signal has gone to 0. So, you see what we have done is we have forced the signal to go to 0. The signal was not going to 0 there was of course, signal is already 0 somewhere here and all this uh, things what you are seeing is noise. So, this is how the noises look like. So, the signal is present only the, you can see clearly the signal here that is FID more clearly only this side uh, his this part of the FID is only noise or signal a little amount of signal with noise. So, therefore, we do not want to have this portion because this portion if I can include in my processing my signal to noise will go down why because the noise is only present and signal is absent. So, therefore, we try to filter filter means we try to stop the data here and what we do is we only now take this part of the data and this part is anyway 0. So, this does not contribute to signal. So, you can see this is what happens. So, this is your signal if I do not uh, apply any window function means if I take directly this you should look at this picture here if I directly take a Fourier transform of this uh, FID I will get a spectrum like this peak like this and signal to noise has been shown to be 27.8. This is from the book uh, by this whole thing has been taken from this book by Keeler uh, and Pavia. So, one of the books uh, the all this book explains. So, the picture is from taken from there. 
uh, and then you can see the signal to noise has been calculated to be 27.8 that is the height of the signal divided by the height of the noise. But now, when I do an upwardization, I smoothen the signal, I mean I apply truncation, this is called a uh, window function and you, you basically make the signal go to 0 and when I do a Fourier transform, I will get a peak like this. So, if you look at compare these two pictures here, you see this picture looks much better the second one, because the noise level has gone down. But what has also happened is your signal height is also gone down. Okay. So, the, why, why the signal height has gone down? The signal height has gone down because the peak has become wide, peak has become broad. So, it was earlier 1 hertz was the line width here, it has become 2 hertz. So, obviously, the height will go down. Remember in NMR, the area is always constant because the area under the peak it gives you the number of hydrogens. So, for the same sample, whatever I do, my area under the peak should not change because that is the important point because that is what I need for my quantification. So, the area of the peak does not change, then if I increase the line width, I have to compensate by reducing the height. So, automatically the height is reduced, so that the area is kept constant, but here the noise has gone down also very high, now down a lot. Therefore, when I take a signal to noise value, I will get better value compared to this is almost double. So, you see by doing this exercise of a window function, I can improve my signal to noise tremendously. Of course, this is not always a factor of 2, it can vary from any way, but typically uh, it can go from uh, 1.5 to a factor of 2, 2.5. So, that is why it is very important to do window function. Again, uh, in nowadays spectrometers, these are done automatically uh, by typing some commands. So, most of the users or students are not aware of what is happening behind the screen. So, therefore, this slide is basically meant to show you that what happens when you process the data. So, there are different ways to upwardize the signal, you can take only the first part of the signal, you can multiply with different functions, these are called window functions and uh, based on that you have to, uh, we can do the processing. So, one thing important to note here is the resolution and this is a very important point in NMR. So, one thing uh, a theory of NMR uh, which uh, we will not go into detail, but it comes from the Fourier transform that the signal, the, the signal is basically present in the beginning. If you look at the FID here, what is happening is the signal is present in the beginning. As the signal time proceeds, the signal goes down to 0. So, that means your sensitivity is all focused in this side. So, if you want to get a very good signal to noise like we saw in the last slide, then your emphasis that means your focus should be on this part. That means you should not give too much importance to this side. When you say too much importance, it means you multiply with a function which takes this part to 0 and what is more important is this part. But let us say you are not interested in signal to noise improving, you have very good signal to noise anyway and your interest lies in the resolution means you want to separate a peak. If you want to do separation of peaks better, then this portion of the spectrum plays a role, the second the later part of the FID. Now, how do you uh, rationalize this? How do you understand this? This can be understand, understood by simple analogy. Let us say we have two trains uh, moving at let us say one moving at 100 kilometers per hour, another moving at 102 kilometers per hour. That means, there is only a difference of 2 kilometers per hour between the two trains. Now, I start the race the two strains start at the same time, but initially they are moving at the same speed, I mean same distance, the distance separation between them is not going to be visibly different. Only when you wait for a long time, then the trains would have really separated in real time and separated in time space by a large distance. So, therefore, if you have two signals, I means two frequencies which are very close, that is like the speed of the train, then you need to wait a long time in the FID for them to be really separated from each other. In the beginning, the two frequencies will look very much alike. You will not be able to say that there are two frequencies here, but only if you wait for a long time towards this side, then you will start seeing that there are two frequencies. What it means that your resolution that is the separation between the peaks appears on this side like more than what appears on this side. So, that means, if I want to get a better resolution my emphasis or weightage or importance should be given to this part of the spectrum rather than going to this part. And that is again done by using different mathematical functions that is the window functions 
and you can look at this kind of a function here. What is happening here? If you see it is giving very less weightage to this part. So, this is multiply with the FID, this is the raw FID. If I multiply with this, this is what is shown here into FID, I will see that the initial portion is giving going to 0, but I am giving more importance to this part. So, therefore, my suppression will become better and better, but the signal to noise will go down. And why is that? Because my the spectrum is given less importance uh, here, which is where the sensitivity is there. So, the signal to noise goes down, but the resolution improves. So, therefore, in NMR that is the major standard thing which we say that if you want to gain sensitivity, you have to lose resolution. Why? Because if I want this part of the spectrum, this part session I have to sacrifice that is where the resolution is there. But if I want to get resolution, then the sensitivity I have to sacrifice because resolution is on the other side, second half the sensitivity is not so much there. So, the resolution and sensitivity are kind of complementary and to gain one you have to lose or trade off the other. So, this is what is shown in this slide also that if you want look at this here, the emphasis is given on this part of the uh, signal and therefore, the signal the line looks broad. But if I want to get a better resolution enhancement, then I will give less weightage to here and I will give more weightage this side. So, you can see here that lines are now you can see some resolution means the lines are getting sharper and there is a separation here you cannot make out how many lines are there peaks are there, but here you can start seeing the peaks. But of course, not shown here, but the sensitivity goes down because of less weightage given to the beginning. So, the next step uh, is to then Fourier transform the spectrum uh, and by applying the upwardization and you get a peak. Uh, this portion, this slides basically talks about what is called truncated FID. Uh, what it means is that suppose you have an FID which you do not complete. Remember we mentioned in the last uh, class that the acquisition has to be uh, or in this class in the beginning we saw that the acquisition time has to be uh, 3 times a T 2, but that does not always happen there is a decrease in the signal to noise uh, if you do not record and when you truncate the FID I mean this is called truncation you will get bad spectrum because of what is called as wiggles and to improve that we apply this window function and do Fourier transform. So, we will come to this uh, end of the class today uh, in the next part uh, we will look at how uh, the signal spectra now once we are recorded the spectrum uh, in different and process the data we will now start looking at how it can be analyzed and the data can be interpreted.